Let's give a warm welcome to Darren. Good afternoon, all. How are you all doing? Pretty good. Thank you. So I guess not many people would know me. I'm a very interactive person. I like to give energy and I like to get energy back. So, and my slideshow today will be very pictorial and will basically tell a story, a um, story of myself and my journey. Um, it's not as personal as it may sound, but um, it's just as far as how I've been involved in this um, research and studying of psychedelics from a, from a personal perspective. But on this journey, I've seen how it's benefited not just me, but my immediate family, without them having to necessarily partake in the substances. And I think how there's benefits to the wider community. And that was just a feeling of thoughts that I had based on my own research. And I've obviously discovered that there's a wider research being done. And I hope that in this presentation, I can join and show you how there's some Asian technology, which is rooted in nature. And it's connected with how I think it will propel us in the future. Um, by day, um, I'm a researcher. I'm a teacher. By day, I work in for an organization called Organically. I work in a local community teaching organic food growing as well as permaculture. Any permaculturalists in the house? Food growers in the house? Yeah, good. Um, my, by day, I teach young people who have been primarily kicked out of school or just come out of prison, and I engage them in you know, food enterprise activities. My goal, would, in a nutshell, I try to get them from selling weed bags to salad bags. And basically, we use the same technology, the same approach they would use in trying to sell drugs, and we try to use that in tangible ways. So I work by day with a lot of young people who have challenges, mental health challenges, you know, physical challenges. So I've seen some of the you know, resources that are being offered to these young people, that some of them work, but for the most part, they don't work. And I'm also aware of some of the tools that we use in our environment that do work, that you know, in, ge in the general society is not considered. And that's just you know, in my day-to-day -day work at Organically, you know, just the methods we work to engage in young people with some of these mental health challenges. Um, and then there's also other streams that are not possible for the fact that you know, it's against the law to be able to do certain things. And um, that's what we'll be exploring a piece of that in my presentation today. So I hope you can journey with me. And, um, I don't start any presentation or talk nowadays without giving these guys a shout out. These are actually known as Cubensis Magic Mushrooms. If it wasn't for these guys, I would not be up here presenting to you and sharing this information. They were a catalyst as well as the fuel and energy to give me the courage and strength to do what I do. So here we go, mental health. When I was asked to come and present, the first thing I said is mental health. I said to myself, I don't know anything about mental health, you know? What, what, I don't even know if I'm sane, you know, in today's world. You know, so what is mental health, you know? By whose standard are we talking about? And um, that would be a question that I'll put out to the audience too, but I guess when we come to Q&A, we can explore that. But it's a question I would ask myself, what is mental health? And um, I would say to myself, keep calm, because I'm fully aware it's a crazy world, where I'm in a, a space in East London, working with young people where day in, day out, we could be having a smooth running day, and I can get a text, a call, an email to let me know that one of my young people are involved in a stabbing, a shooting, you know, just, it just flips my world immediately after being in the garden and doing some, you know, some horticultural practices. So I'm aware how crazy this world can currently be, or currently is, as well as all the other things that, you know, you just turn on the TV and you see. But I'm aware that the forest will make you happy. Anybody goes out in nature, use the space for therapeutic benefits, consciously or subconsciously? There you go. And I'm also aware that when you go back to the Asian world and you find happy people with a minimal amount of resources that we would consider that we have and that we're privileged to have, you know, they're happy. And you know, you can go from Africa, you can go to Asia, you know, parts in Europe where you find indigenous cultures with minimum resources and they're always smiling. Why? But I want to introduce you, just by looking at it, do anybody know any the, the group of people on the screen? Has anybody heard of the pygmies? So the pygmies, that's how, how they refer to, that's a derogatory term. That's not actually how they refer to themselves. They refer to themselves by a range of different indigenous names. They're known as the Aka, the Baka, the Mbuti. But the reason I'm sharing this journey with you and how it relates to mental health is because you've got people that are connected to the most indigenous and nation sacred plants, and they are the most oldest people recorded as well as in unrecorded history that we can find on earth. To the point when the first Europeans encountered these groups of people, they didn't refer to them as humans. They actually referred to them as some kind of an advanced primate, some kind of advanced apes. And as I was told as young, a young black male growing up in this UK, you know, when Europeans first come to Africa, they found us swinging in trees or found us in the trees. And that's true, you find these people living in the trees. That's where they live. You know, when you go to most jungle regions or you know, forests, most smart people who live in the region <laughs> raise, their, <laughs> raise where they live off the ground because that's especially being three, four foot high being on the grass, you've got scorpions, hippos, snakes, all the rest of it, be pretty wise to get yourself up. So all these things though had negative connotations 
growing up hearing about it so this is part of my mental health challenges that I've had growing up but then to come back to find out these are the most oldest people <coughs> most indigenous you know um, have got this knowledge and science of these sacred plants that today's science is now talking about I was always curious to find out well what do these people have got to say about these plants and how do they use them so just to give you a bit of background onto them and then we're going to whisk through some of these slides but the African pygmy population such as the Aka, the Baka, the Bongo and so forth <coughs> because it's genetic they have high levels of genetic diversity genetically these groups are extremely divergent from all other human populations suggesting they have an Asian indigenous lineage their uniparental markers represent the most ancient divergent ones right after those typically found in the Khoisan in the Khoisan people of South Africa so basically you've got these these two old groups one in the central region of Africa and West Africa and then you've got down south, the Khoisan, they're known as the Khoi Khoi or the San people, commonly called the Bushmen. These people are the most oldest people we can find to the point where if you actually communicate with these people and ask them where they're from, they actually say they have unearthly origins. But that's another subject. But when you bring it down to earth and they talk about the wisdom and knowledge that they have on earth, it's a lot of it is again geared around the knowledge of plants and nature and so forth. Um, but these groups possess a high, um, have an, an, an Asian tradition of medicinal plant use and has a rich tradition of using its indigenous plants for these purposes. African traditional culture, indeed African traditional medicine, are the oldest and possibly most diverse of all medicinal systems. Psychoactive plants have been used for recreational, spiritual and therapeutic purposes for millenniums. Given Africa's high floristic diversity and a strong connection between plants, relatively few African psychoactive plants have been investigated. Of 97 reviewed plants with proven or alleged hallucinogenic potential, only eight species were of African origin. Scientists have studied the chemistry and biological activity of Ebola and a handful of other psychoactive plants, but the majority have only been investigated superficially, if not at all. Um, by a show of hands, how many people have heard or are familiar with Ebola? Um, when I Google word Ebola, when I find that when I first found out Ebola, this is pretty much what I was finding out about um, Ebola was really good for heroin addicts and alcohol, people who are suffering from alcoholism. Is that what the people who had their hands raised, is that kind of what people have been hearing about Ebola and Ebola and how it's being used? And how, for example, say some with alcohol or, you know, um, heroin addicts are going on these various retreats or spaces, you know, in the Netherlands and Costa Rica and in Africa. And like in, a, in the night, in some cases overnight or over two to three day sittings, are having, you know, having experiences that are dealing with their traumas and addictions that are allowing them to not have the, the um, addictive um, traits that they had that, you know, got them caught up in the drug in the first place. So for example, say they would have the, ex the, the psychedelic experience, but then they would have the therapy that goes along with it that would allow them to revisit maybe the time when they was first introduced to that drug or that substance or that person who abused them and they would kind of re, you know, refigure the, the, the situation and they would come out of the city and not have the addictive or the traumatic things associated with that. So this is stuff that I was hearing. And um, you know, this is kind of like you do, as I said, you do your Googles, you find out your bowl games a natural alkaloid extracted from a boot rock, root bark in South Africa. In, in Africa. Um, what else, the research they was doing that, you know, this, um, what is it, let me actually read this mechanism allowed for the antidotal report suggested that a single treatment of Ebola reduces cravings of various drugs of abuse for up to six months. And um, I'm just highlighting that there's a lot of research being done in relation to Ebola, heroin addiction, alcohol recovery, there's conferences taking place all around the world. And I find this really interesting and useful because again, in my community, we've got a lot of drug addicts and I'm, I work with them day in, day out. So when I hear these things, I'm thinking, oh, this is good research and how, you know, how is this gonna impact on you know, us in the here and now as well? Um, so this is, you know, um, what's going on now. But then in the 1950s, the CIA conducted experiments using Ebola, and they done experiments in the Lexington Federal Penitentiary in Kentucky on African American inmates, and they were held in a secret from the public until a document request regarding Ebola game through the Freedom of Information Act years later in the 1980s was obtained by Howard Lotsoff, and the document by the CIA doctor requesting more supplies of Ebola game because he was having success with his patients who again were suffering from various um, drug addictions. So that's when I've done my Googles, my initial Googles, that's what I was hearing, you know, that's what Ebola's for. And by day, as I said, I, I teach and I'm interested in, you know, nature, and that led me to be also interested in, um, you know, indigenous cultures and their way of life, and that leads you into mythology and leads you into so many other areas of, of research. So knowing and understanding that African culture, as I do, I was thinking, you know, well, if this is what Ebola's good for, I wonder if they have heroin addicts in Gabon, and in, you know, in these regions, or, you know, are they suffering from alcoholism? Is, in, is this what this thing is for, or does it have, another purpose, or that it's, you know, what, what is it here for? So what do you do? For me, I go to the root, let's go and see what the people say about this and what it's all about, and then we move forward. 
So today in Gabon, ancestor cults still flourish their members share a common belief based on direct experience in the existence of the supernatural realm where the spirits of the ancestors may be contacted. The Babongo are the originators of the Briti religion and it's based on the consumption of the Iboga plant. I want to highlight this. The Briti practitioners use the root bark specially cultivated for the religion to promote radical spiritual growth, to stabilize community and family structure and to resolve pathological problems. Now when I read that, I was like, bam, what? Um, <laughs> Like personally, when I started this journey myself, I wanted to, I started it for my own personal development and you know, spiritual development. But to look at how they could use it potentially to stabilize community and family structure. By a show of hands, how many people's community is stable and family structures are you know, really solid out here? You know, um, pathological problems, you know, people are honest enough to hold up their hands to say that they suffer from you know, pathological problems where you may be doing things that don't serve you well, but you, know, you still do it, you still have these habits and you, you know, Whatever they are. By a show of hands, who's honest enough to acknowledge that? Who's an alcohol and acknowledge it? No. <laughs> <laughs> so it's that, you know, we've got these issues. We've all got challenges in some way or another. And I believe that in some cases, these plants have been a part of their way of life in these cultures. And this is why they can live a very simple life and still be happy. Um, in essence, I just wanted to highlight where they, where they say the Evolver plant come from. It's rooted in their mythology. They talk about the creator God giving, um, killing a p particular pygmy and then distributing his fingers and toes around the, around the environment and outgrow the Evolver the bush, he, he, what they refer to as Evolver. But um, later on, his wife goes in search of, the, of her husband because he's gone missing and she later finds him in a cave. So I'm you know, shortening the mythology. But when she gets to the cave, she finds a pile of bones. The bones and tell her to look to the left of the cave. She then eats this root and then she sees her dead with her husband and all of her previous dead relatives. And basically the information that she's given is that this plant she is now engaged with is going to enable her to communicate with the dead and her ancestors. And it was a, it was a, it's been the first recorded baptism in, in beauty tradition and basically in the world as we know it. So in this ceremony and the ceremonies that come out of that are rooted in a lot of the ceremonies we have in religion today, like in the church when you think of the um, Holy Communion and cultures where they have blessed sacraments, a lot of this is rooted in the same, in, in, in these same processes. So where am I going with all of this? I'm just wanting to highlight that in ancient Africa they have a knowledge and a history of using these plants and it keeps them, not only their personal, um, it keeps themselves in check, but it helps to keep the community in check. It's like a way that they're used for assessing. So these are things I didn't learn in history class when I went to school. I'm first generation born in the UK, and I was pretty much told nothing about African history. And when we did have Black History Month, there was a f mainly a focus just on slavery. And that's not, on, that's not all of Africans' history. So where am I going with all of this? I'm here to share with you that there's a trauma that I've inherited, and I carry that with me day in, day out. And these plants that I gave you have allowed me to work through that. And I believe it can benefit others, not just on the African community, but as I've travelled around the world, all cultures that have suffered from some kind of trauma that today's medicine isn't really supporting. And there's ancient technology that supports this idea. So from the African perspective, we, the, oh, so the slide before, and I know I may have drifted a little bit and I don't want to go over time, but I will fly through these slides quickly. But the reason why I share this is because these images may be challenging as you view through them, but I want to get a clear picture that this is what's been hidden and swept under the rug. And this is what I have inside of me and also what I've got to deal with and work through myself. And I've been able to do that using these plants. So I want you to walk with me through these pictures and just understand where I'm coming from. So this image represents the triangular trade slave trade between Europe, Africa and the Americas. And just to, to run through it, that the immediate human impact on that, that there was over 20 million people captured and ultimately only 10 million survived or made it through to where they were, ended up, were, were meant to end up and planted. These people were branded and treated like products and materials. They were, there were places like Jamaica that were known as the Breaker Islands, where people were literally broken into becoming slaves, just like you would break a horse. You know, people were captured and taken around. And these are not actually African people from the African continent. These are Australians. So I just want to highlight, I'm also aware that there's um, these, things, these things have been inherited around all around the world. As I've traveled to Prague and different places and just hearing people's stories, I'm aware of the trauma that is ancient that people carry with them. So I know there's stuff going on in Australia, and today I saw on the internet um, the Australian government talking about how if they can deport some of the Aborigines, whose land it is, if I'm not correct. Mm. Yeah. Anyway, so these people suffer diff different forms of abuse. On the land, off the land, they were killed, hung, burnt at the stake. At some point in time, they were liberated. But during that time, not, never once, over 400 years, did these people receive any kind of therapy, any kind of help, any kind of... Are you right? Pat on the back. There's any kind of sympathy whatsoever. You just put, basically put out there to your own devices. Where am I going with that? There's some long-term effects, basically. I'm really sh giving you 400 years in, tr in two minutes, but there's a lot of long-term effects of the of the byproduct that, that people don't discuss or people don't talk about. 
And because my day job, I'm working with these young people, and a lot of people are so quick to say, you see these young people, they're just stabbing and shooting each other and they're just doing stuff like they're just waiting. And I say, do you think these young people just want to wake up and go out and stab and shoot people? Because I'm a byproduct, I come from that community. What I'm here to share with you is these people have got a mental illness that they don't, they're not aware of. They don't realise the baggage that they carry. And um, no, they don't just want to wake up and shoot and stab each other. They've been programmed to do that. We've been experimented on for over 400 years. And we have some mental health issues and challenges that we don't even know we carry. And this is what I'm here I'm trying to share with you and others in the world. I'm not a doctor, I'm not a, you know, I don't have a background in this area, but I'm aware of what I see and engage with on a day-to-day -day basis. So what I found is that you've got people who don't know who, who they are and what their identity is. And this is then being affected on people all around the world. But I will move slowly. So you've got all these hundreds of years ago, and then boom, again, we've got use for these people again. Let's bring them back into Europe. The ring rush, everybody, if you didn't know, you definitely know in the last year or so about the whole ring rush stuff. And that's what where, where I come into the picture. And that's my mother being the first generation to come to the UK as a 10 year old. She was told that these streets were paved with gold. That's what she was told, she believed that. And she said that when she arrived as a 10 year old, she cried for three months because she couldn't believe how cold it was, how dark it was, how gray it was. And she had been given this idea that she was coming to you know, Disney World, or around there, wherever it was she was coming to. But you had people who come with skills and with, you know, come, come to do the right thing, basically. And you know what they face, you just have to look at the signs, we're all aware, so I won't focus much into that, but it's just to highlight that. You have people who really come to try to do the right thing. They're already coming to do the right thing, my grandparents and other people. Where am I going with this? This is the meet and greet. This is who they had to meet and greet. And to deal with that, some of my uncles and elders started to go into this world here. And why am I going with this? Because it's like, these are all the things that we started to do to cope with our mental health. That we did problems that we didn't know we had. And this is just how we dealt with it. Like many other people deal with it, you just suppress stuff. And these softer drugs turn into harder drugs. And then these harder drugs turn into what we've got today with these young people as far as all this knife crime, because it became territorial. And I'm saying all of this to say, because it's like mental health, what's going on? I, I can't clinically diagnose what these people have got. I didn't know what this was or what it is, but I knew there was something wrong. And then I started to do my further research and find that, you know, there's black offenders are high, suicide is increasing, there's, there's, something, there's something happening in my community real bad and it's like it's, it's not, nothing's being said or being dealt with, you know, it's not being dealt with or it's not being acknowledged. And now I don't know if anybody's heard of this term before, post-traumatic slave syndrome. People have a PTSD. Pretty much, it's a basically America's legacy or a world legacy of enduring injury and healing. And this is basically just to highlight the fact that I'm talking about of People are going through over four to 500 years of trauma and never receiving any help. And it says here, PTSD is a theory that explains the root cause of many of the adaptive survival behaviors of African-American communities throughout the United States and the diaspora. In its, it's, it is a condition that exists as a consequence of multi-generational oppression of Africans and their descendants resulting from centuries of chattel slavery, a form of slavery which is predicated on the belief that African inherent were inherently genetically inferior to whites. This was then followed by the institutionalized racism which continues to perpetrate injury, thus resulting in MAP, which is multi-generational trauma together with continued oppression, absence of opportunity to heal or access the benefits available in society, which then leads to post-traumatic slave syndrome. People familiar with epigenetics, you know, all the research, so this is the stuff, and I'm just here to share a story from a black man's African's perspective, but I'm also aware, because of my peers, how this is influencing people from other areas and cultures too, and that this is something that we've all inherited in some way or another, and science is now just saying, hey, what can we do and what's going to be done about it? Um, what I'm also here to share is that, and why I appreciate, and as I sit in the room, I can see a sister over there to my left, but in most cases, when I come to these environments, I'm normally the only person of colour, the black, only black person in these spaces, and um, I didn't ever want to come up and talk and speak, it wasn't actually what I wanted to do, but I was like, well, you know, you've got something to say, it's not being said, you know, it's important to be said, so just say it. And I'm here to just say that I don't know who's in the audience. I hope that I just, I'm just here to inspire people who do have the opportunity to do the work and, you know, put forward the cases, to hear me out at least, and be considered when decisions are being made. Because in my day job and in other areas of work, I'm always asked to be, I deal with diversity a lot and inclusion and what it takes and doing the right outreach type of work. And this is where we're going to round up as far as the direction that I'm going in and hopefully it should be clear where I'm, what I'm trying to say. So in this case here, um, it says suicide isn't just a white people thing. Um, as, as a sociologist, criminologist, I often do community outreach on mental health prevention. I urge organisations and programmes to avoid the one size fits all approach. There are many ways that mental health issues can impact individuals depending upon race, ethnicity, gender, identity, sexual identity, religion and more. 
but I have found mental health conditions and suicide are often considered a white people's problem. When I speak with African Americans and non-white Hispanics, groups are often overlooked by the mental health community. And I'm often asked, why am I wasting time addressing race, ethnicity, and other cultural variations? And in all honesty, that's how I feel it sometimes when I do the work that I do. It's like, what's the point? You know, why are you isolating or making this thing separate from you know what everybody else needs? And I'm not, I don't want to, but it's the fact that in some areas we're really neglected and that there's not many people that speak up. So that's why I decided to speak up and be counted. So we're now in what's known as the psychedelic renaissance or renaissance. Who's heard of that? Who's heard the terms before be floating around? Yeah. So like with all that, like, and I don't want to put every, look, I've got, I, I like good energy, man. I've tried to roll with good energy. So I know I might have shared some challenging and images and so forth, but there's a rainbow at the end. There's light at the end. And that's why I feel good about all of this. And there's a renaissance. But just like I said previously, this is all about being part of or being around the table being included so I'm aware of all the research that was being done on PTSD and when I started looking at what all that was about I thought this corresponds with the stuff with PTSS the stuff that I see in my day to day world I wonder what this research how it's going to benefit everybody or who will it benefit this started to be and then as I started to do more research it started to become a bit of a concern and I st you can do your own research but the research being done by MAPS at Imperial College there's a lot of stuff being done with MDMA and the benefits of PTSD you know it has with PTSD um, if they've been working with the military vets in the USA, it benefited 100% of the, of the guys coming out of the military with their PTSD. 68% totally eliminated, 32 it was reduced and they had to go back either six months or a year later for a further dose, but was able to come off their medication and so forth. They found out a range of different things. People that had you know, PTSD for over 17 years were able to deal with this, having the MDMA along with the therapeutic sittings were able to deal with their challenges. One of the participants, and James says, I think MDME assisted psychotherapy is one of the most important things we need to be focused on in terms of mental health. It blows every other treatment for PTSD out of the water. And this is where we end up. So where I'm at now is that most people who know me know me as the mushroom man. I like, I'm very, and I'm say, I say that simply because I love the organism itself. You know, I'm a horticulturist by day, and I'm also aware of the role and function that it plays in the grander scheme of things as far as the bio, this, this organism that we live on called planet Earth. But to come to find out that magic mushrooms can help set this, um, reset depressed brains, the research that they've done, it was like eight to nine out of the participants that they uh, done, done the research with came out of that, again, not needing the medication that they required to deal with their depression. You can just pop on the TV now, they're talking about LSD for anxiety. You know, MDMA trials, not only for um, <laughs> PTSD, also for alcoholism. These are some of the, I'm saying, showing all this simply because these, this is what the young people that I work with are challenged by. I'm sick. I can see how it's been set up and how they're going to perpetuate the same things. It's going to get deeper and darker if something hasn't been done. And what's, hap what's being offered to them isn't working. It's fake, making them fall further into these traps. So all I'm saying and all I'm trying to share today with all of you is that if there are people, if you know of people that are into this field, that there should be some kind of diversity, equality and inclusion in all of this. Equal opportunity of, equality of opportunity is not the same as equality of participation. Pictures paint a thousand words, you can have a look at that and that's what I try to tell people all the time. I'm not, I'm not about equality. Equality doesn't mean it's going to be fair. And it's always the usual suspects. So diversity is being invited to the party, inclusion is being asked to dance. And I appreciate being invited here and being asked to dance because a lot of the times I'm asked to just be in the audience and then when you, ask to, when you want to get involved, it's like, this isn't your time or place. So I really appreciate that they're giving a platform for people who are not the doctors, not the scientists, because they may not have the time or may not have the interest or may not have been given the funding to do the research to look into this area, but I'm very much interested in it. So I'm glad that I don't no longer have to sit at the back of the bus and that we can sit all together and mingle around. I really appreciate that. But also I know that we also need to be able to sit around the table when the decisions are being made, that we shouldn't be asked after the fact. And I believe we will be all happy, smiley people in the future if we're working from that premise. That's me, Aaron Swinger. And if wow. you want to find me and what I'm about, Darren, are you seeing people in your community who are coming to you with the various problems that you mentioned, the historical uh, legacy and anger, and are you seeing some of them uh, given a new direction, a lease of life through this, um, similar to what you mentioned for the people with PTSD? I would say a very, 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 very small amount. Um, in most, in the most case, in my community, the subject matter is a taboo. People are not really interested in this subject matter when it's raised. It's not considered something that, you know, is... A, a realistic path 
And at the same time, a lot of people in my community are not aware of their, of their history. Like, we wouldn't talk this in history class. I've made a conscious effort to go out to find out this information. So for the most part, as I said, people are not aware of the luggage and the baggage that they carry. So what they're perpetuating is just a reactionary and they're not aware of what it's actually rooted in. So no, people are not consciously doing this stuff and that's why I felt the mushroom says, boom, you've got to get out there and start you know, speaking up a bit more. Time for maybe one or two comments or questions, if any be. Ah, Rupesh? Well, I'm just wondering about the difference between the sort of like uh, medicinal use of these drugs and the recreational use of these drugs, like MDMA and ecstasy. Sure. What is the difference there? I think the main difference is, as we say in psychedelics, set and set in. So the recreational use is, you know, you're going out partying on a Friday, Saturday, and, you know, loading that with drinks, cocaine, or whatever else might go with that. In the therapeutic setting, you're in the, the right set and set in. You're also going through the process along with, you know, a clinical doctor, as well as the, the settings, two, maybe two or three settings after that, that support the experience. So it's similar sort of dosages? Um, that's not what, that's not my forte, man. So yeah, you know, people like Dr. Ben Cesar, Dr. Robin Carhart, these are the guys that are, you know, in the UK doing the research and they've got, you know, all the information out there that you would need. And I'm, I'm just researching, checking out the same stuff myself. And what's the risk that people have a good uh, experience in a therapeutically controlled setting with good guides and then afterwards they say, well, I want to get back there and they, they do it in a less guided and less controlled setting and they end up uh, more harmed than helped? So um, the reality of it is that there's more harm caused on a weekend through alcohol and all the other things that we're, you know, that we're readily giving to people out there. Um, most people that are on that path of healing and therapy are rarely re end up respecting the plants and approach it from a perspective where you know, it's not reckless. And um, there are, in some, of the, in some of these cases with the drugs, there are some you know, physical challenges. But Dr. Professor Nutt, who's recently released his studies, have shared with everybody in you know, the world that you know, the psychedelics are at the end of the spectrum when it comes to harmful drugs. And that, you know, at, at, at the rate they can be, you know, um, they can be killed or harmed from them. You know, you've got alcohol, cigarettes, way up there, right down, right down on the bottom is mushrooms, you know, followed by all the, others, all the other guys. So a lot of our fear around these plants, I believe, are, you know, are just that fear that's been perpetuated against us and don't actually really exist. In terms of your own journey, you said that these, um, this was a tool to enable you to acknowledge some of these um, mm -hmm. traumatic experiences that you were carrying along. How do you actually go went through your own experience? Like, who did you approach to really understand what was the right amount, how to do okay, it, okay. and so on? Because it, it feels like it's something it's out there, but you don't really know who to trust and how to do it in a, in a secure way. I can appreciate that. So uh, what's interesting, I was um, schooled by some warrior martial artists and their approach isn't necessarily the same approach that is generally put out there. So I always share the two approaches. So I was taught, this is how I was taught, this is the journey of the alone into the alone. And any time I would ask him questions, he would say, you need to go into this space and take those questions into that space with you. And you're then, it's then revealed to you what you need to do. And it's kind of having faith in that journey, which can be a scary, challenging journey. But then on the flip side, you're also shared, as I said, about set and setting. If you are going to do it, you're going to do it in a place where it's legal to be able to do it. You know, you make the right choices, you're with the right people, if you're going to do it with people. And then you're also guided, you know, you can go to various websites, you know, like um, Maps being one of them. Um, there's a few others. That, you know, I've got, I've got all the doctors and scientists who've shared, you know, if you are going to do this, this is what we recommend you do on how you should do it in a safe, you know, in a safe way. So um, I was taught that, you know, you take this and you go into those spaces. And for me personally, that's how I started this journey. It became very challenging. And then after that, you know, I went to, I went to my mum. I went to my sisters. I went to the, like, I, I realised it. Because what it revealed to me is that it was conversations that I needed to have. There was things that I needed to do. It was more personal and intimate than me needing to actually go to hospital and get, start getting medication. It was a lot of baggage that I was carrying and stuff that I've inherited that I didn't even know I inherited. So just to give you a glimpse of some of the work that I'm doing in my immediate family that have come out of these experiences, like in one of my experiences, I've, I, became one of, I became one of or all of the women in my family. And I actually felt a snippet of the abuse and trauma that the women in my family have experienced, which was a slap in the face for me, although I've done, I didn't perpetuate any of this, but just to experience that and to know that this is what all of the women in my family are holding and that a lot of this has been swept under the rug, it's been perpetuated by males in my family. It wasn't easy to receive that, but then to be shared and guided in a way that I can support my family in dealing with that and opening up these conversations 
having the right people. I've got my mum's, you know, my mum's a, a psychiatrist. You know, I've got the right people around me to do to do the work. But we all still kind of easily sweep things up under the rug. So what this has done is open up a lot of conversations I mean, for me and my family that have actually helped us without having to go to get you know, official therapy and stuff like that. If that answers your question. You want to should be one more question and I'll turn over the slides for the next speaker. Okay. Um, I'm curious. rather than being close with the mental hospitals and stuff like that. Is there a certain, did you ever actually communicate and have a conversation about even more serious cases and about like how the certain type of darkness mm -hmm. in everyday life is actually supposed to heal us in these yeah. different ways? Yeah. Uh, so if I'm hearing you correctly, so to the two parts of that. So one, mm -hmm. in cases where, you know, in indigenous cultures, when in Africa in particular, I can speak on that, where we talk about schizophrenia, and we talk about all, all the titles that we give these things now. In our culture, that's, you would be considered, you know, a, a sacred one. <laughs> you would be considered, yeah, you've got the eye, you know, and he hears the voices, he hears the ancestors, you know, that's kind of how we approach it. So it's kind of like a different, a different view. So that's up for, for yeah. For, for conversation, but then as far as the dark side or dealing with your shadow, um, without going into too much, I don't know, has anybody seen the film Big Fish with Ewan McGregor? I'll just always use that film as an example of dealing and facing the shadow or your dark side. And he basically, the film, the concept of it is that as they're toddlers, they're taught that there's this old woman who lives in the village, and if you go up there and see the village and you look in her eye, um, you find out how you die. And um, they all say, yeah, let's go up there and see the woman, and let's all look in her eye. They all run up there, and you know, maybe three or four of them. And by the time they get to the top of the hill, and the woman's opening the door, a few of them run off, just leaving one of them. He looks up, the woman opens the door, she's literally saying, well, you're going to stay there and look. He's like, yeah, I'm brave enough. She shows him the eye. He sees how he dies. He comes back to his friends. They're like, what's going on? You didn't die? What? He goes, like, no, I didn't die. It's all good. And then he's starting to live life now. And he's, as he's moving through life, he's starting to appreciate that by seeing the ultimate dark side, which is his death, he started to feel more liberated. And there was two scenes in the film that I always remember. There's one when there's a woman, there's a girl that he likes, there's always a girl that the hero likes. Uh, but she likes someone else, or someone else likes her. And he basically goes, he keeps on talking to her. And the, 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 you know, the bad boyfriend's like, why do you keep on talking to her? Get my girlfriend, I told you to stop talking to her. And then he sees him again talking to her, and he goes, that's it. So him and the few of his friends roll up their sleeves, and they're basically gonna give him a kick in. And he's there, there's probably four or five of them around him. And he's, at well, first he's probably like a little nervous, and he says, this isn't how I die rolls up your sleeves, come on guys, let's do this. And, get, and basically that's what the film is showing you about facing your dark side, facing your shadow, really gives you true liberation. And that's what these blessed sacraments, especially that they teach in the churches and these various ceremonies, are rooted in you really dealing with your shadow. The whole ceremony is around that, I guess, in mythology about going into the underworld. And that underworld is your subconscious. And you know, dealing with your dark side, man, and bringing it up and facing it and stuff like that. So I'm all for and pro that. These plants definitely support that. I really hope the research and studies continue to support that like they already are doing, but I just hope that everybody who needs it gets access to it. Let's stop the conversation there for the moment. Darren, you'll come back and dance some more uh, <laughs> later in the event. But I'd like to bring in uh, now uh, Anya. I'm just going to, uh, Anya's going to give the second part of her perspective on this. Uh, Psychedelic okay. Renaissance. We've already had that phrase. Maybe yes. you can tell us more about it. So let's welcome Anya. Hello. 